the Egyptian Empire. What happened here, and why has so little survived? This is the story of one of the most traumatic episodes in the whole of ancient Egyptian history. Under these sands lie the ruins of a religious experiment that rocked the Egyptian empire to its foundations. For many at the time, it seemed to promise a heaven on earth. For many others, it became their worst nightmare. The mysterious ruins were discovered last century in Amarna in Middle Egypt, far from Cairo in the north and Luxor in the south. The first strange clues to this lost city were found in tombs hewn in the surrounding cliffs. The walls of this tomb are covered with unusual reliefs. This relief shows a king and his wife. We know it's a royal couple because of the clothes they're wearing, but we can't tell who they are. Their faces have been chiseled out. Even their names were hacked away. But a clue to their identity lay in the sagging belly of the pharaoh and in the image of the sun bathing the royal couple in sunlight. These had a familiar look. Similar images appear on the throne of the most famous pharaoh of all, Tutankhamun. Maybe Tutankhamun and the faceless pharaoh were closely related? Some even suggested they were father and son. The mystery king and queen were finally identified when undamaged reliefs were found in the Amarna ruins. He was Akhenaten, an enigmatic pharaoh held by some as a visionary, branded by others as a heretic and a criminal. She was Nefertiti, one of the most beautiful women of the ancient world, and also one of the most powerful. Nefertiti, even while she's queen, is shown doing things in ways that other queens never are. She wears pharaoh's crowns, which other uh, queens do not, even while she's still queen. She is shown in one case smiting her enemies, just like a pharaoh does. No other queen is shown this way. Akhenaten and Nefertiti were husband and wife. They ruled Egypt in the middle of the 14th century BC, just 20 years before Tutankhamun. And yet for all their importance, they might as well never have lived. This is a temple at Abydos, 60 miles north of Luxor. It contains a list of the kings of ancient Egypt published by Seti I. But the list is incomplete. There is no mention of Akhenaten. This is the name of his predecessor, Amenhotep III. Akhenaten's own name should be next, but it's missing. The list jumps straight to the next dynasty. It turns out there was an active campaign to erase Akhenaten's reign from ancient Egyptian history. Whenever it was necessary to refer to this period or to Akhenaten himself, he was only referred to as the heretic. What did Akhenaten do that was so terrible? Akhenaten and Nefertiti first made a name for themselves in Thebes, the capital of Egypt during the 14th century BC.
The conquest of foreign lands, from Sudan in the south to present-day Syria in the north, had brought untold power and riches to the Egyptian empire. Thebes, modern-day Luxor, was its capital, and Karnak its main temple. Larger than the Vatican, Karnak was built more than 3,000 years ago, when Egypt's religion was polytheism, belief in many gods. The king, with his priests, prayed to these gods on behalf of his people. In Thebes, the most important god was Amun, Symbolized by his two-feathered crown, he was a god of fertility and creation. Each year, the Amun cult staged a popular procession along the River Nile of floating shrines with statues of the gods. All that came to an abrupt end when Akhenaten became king around 1353 BC. In a startling move, he abandoned Amun in favor of a different god. The Aten, or sun disk. The sun god was as old as ancient Egypt. He had been worshiped by the first dynasties 1,000 years earlier, during the time of the pyramids. Akhenaten's decision would have shocked the influential army of Amun-worshipping priests. They expected their pharaoh to worship Amun above all other gods. Akhenaten was refusing to do that. Worse still, he was actually promoting another god to rival status. What possessed the king to scorn the established god of Thebes? There's evidence that his father, the previous king, Amenhotep III, was already leaning towards sun worship. These are colossal statues of Amenhotep III himself. They were built during his lifetime out of a very special stone. It's quartzite, and the pharaoh had to transport it at huge expense from quarries many miles from here. What made it so desirable was its golden glowing color. Quartzite was associated by the ancient Egyptians with the sun god. The statues were also positioned to catch the first gleam of light from the rising sun. Such overt homage to the sun god was unusual at the time, but that's as far as this pharaoh dared to go. His son Akhenaten had no such qualms, he believed the sun deserved its own full-blown cult. Five years into his reign, Akhenaten unleashed another shockwave. Thebes, he announced, was too closely linked to a moon and so unsuitable for the Aten. The sun disk needed its own holy city. The existing capital of the Egyptian empire had to be abandoned. To the consternation of the priests, Akhenaten and a small band of loyal nobles left Thebes in search of a new capital. After scouring the length of the Nile, he came upon a site in the middle of Egypt. It was exactly halfway between Thebes and Memphis, about 170 miles from each. The shore where Akhenaten landed is in a region now called Amarna. The villagers live in a fertile stretch of land on the east bank of the Nile. Beyond it lies a forbidding plain surrounded by cliffs. It was as bleak then as it is today. No one would dream of running the Egyptian empire from such a desolate and remote spot, yet it was here that Akhenaten decided to build his new capital. The king must have been aware that the move would come as a shock to his subjects because he went to great lengths to justify his decision. He gave his reasons in writing, 
they can still be read today in an unexpected place atop one of the cliffs overlooking the city. A symbol of the Aten has been carved into the rock as a boundary marker. Below it is a text. It says that His Majesty found here the place of origin of the Aten, after arriving mounted on a great chariot of gold and silver. Why did Akhenaten think that this was the birthplace of the Aten? He and his supporters arrived here with only tents for accommodation. This truly was virgin land, with no links to any other gods. And the king found something even more convincing. In Egyptian belief, the horizon where the sun rose was called the Akhet. It was symbolized by two mountain peaks, with the sun disk rising between them. The hills that surround the Amarna Plain are suddenly interrupted by a break in the cliffs. A sight to behold, especially at dawn. The king must have thought he'd found the sacred birthplace of the sun god. He named his city Akat Aten, Horizon of the Sun Disk. The site has been buried for over 3,000 years, but this century, excavators have unearthed the remains of over 100 buildings. It's now possible to virtually recreate the entire city. Even the interior decoration can be determined from fragments of color on tomb columns. In the heart of the city stood the temple to the Aten. Right next to the king's house and throne room. The finished interiors were in stark contrast to the barracks-like exteriors, but this was a city built in a hurry. There was still scaffolding around when the royal family moved in. It's rare to find remains of ancient Egyptian dwellings. These ruins can actually offer a glimpse into how a middle-class family lived. This one was the home of a sculptor called Tatmozi. It's typical of dozens of houses subsidized by Akhenaten to lure the middle classes here, the first planned suburb in history. Here was a comfortable lifestyle, at least for the grown-ups. This was the master bedroom with its own bathroom, but no such luck for the children. It's likely they had to sleep with the servants. Although Akhet Aten was long ago abandoned, there's still life in the area. Several villages nestle between the ancient ruins and the Nile. In many ways, life has changed little since Pharaonic times. Today's inhabitants are a mix of the old indigenous population and Arab tribes who moved into the area in the Middle Ages. Glimpses of daily life in ancient times can be seen on fragments of reliefs from Akhenaten's temples. People were paid in bread and beer. A heavy loaf and a strong brew were just reward for a good day's work. <laughs> 